The 1970s was a significant time for Hawaiians. Struggles were erupting when we made efforts to correct long-standing injustices. Abuses of land and cultural rights were at the forefront of our awareness, and we were determined to stand our ground. We had awakened to the vision that our political voice and the struggle to keep our culture relevant in contemporary times were the most important things for our people. Back in when we were homeless to our own land, back in when we were homeless to our own spirit, there was no hope back in, there was no dreams prior to stuff like the 70s. Fundamentally, if you're Hawaiian, uh, your, your expectation of society was not as good as other people's expectations. You're expected to die younger, you're expected to make less money, you're expected to do worse in school, you're expected some more of you will be in prisons than others, all that whole stuff. History has shown in many native cultures that the path to a better future comes by following in the wake of the ancestors. Polynesians had migrated to Hawaii, traveling vast distances of ocean in strong voyaging canoes, using ancient traditions of celestial navigation. The art of canoe building and navigation had been nearly forgotten in Hawaii and Polynesia with the introduction of modern ships and instruments. During the period now known as the Hawaiian Renaissance, a few men decided it was time to resurrect this ancient knowledge. My own personal interest was in rebuilding what I saw to be the central object of Polynesian culture. No culture can persist without its objects. And when an object is lost, then the memory of it becomes vague and distorted and eventually becomes just a fable. So my thought is by rebuilding the object that I consider to be the central object of Polynesian culture. Why central? Because were it not for that object, there would be no Polynesians today, right? So that, how central can you get? What we have to do is, since the canoes are gone, the navigators are dead, is rebuild the canoes, relearn the navigation, and then sail, make navigated voyages between the islands. Ben had been working on that same idea for years, too. Uh, had built the Nalihia, a smaller double-hulled, classically Hawaiian canoe, which we use as a training vessel. We start working together. That's when he was drawing canoes. And then finally we said, let's do it. Herb Kane, a native Hawaiian artist, Ben Finney, a California anthropologist, and Tommy Holmes, a renowned waterman, formed the Polynesian Voyaging Society. I zeroed in on those features of canoe design, which by their wide distribution throughout Polynesia must have been the most ancient. So using those particular features of design, uh, I, uh, I did a drawing for Pokulea. And then uh, finally, when everyone agreed on, on the my third drawing, I sat down and did the construction drawings. Nineteen seventy-five, uh, we launched, and in the summer, I took it around the islands uh, on the on its maiden voyage. It was a feeling of uh, uh, triumph in getting it into the water. And, and she looked so beautiful on the water. Uh, it was just as most of us had envisioned her. So yes, it was uh, quite a great moment. Sailing to Tahiti and back was a dream that we wanted to, uh, to see fulfilled but it was not my primary concern. My primary concern was that the canoe be accepted by the Hawaiian people. People just came and sat all around and just looked at the canoe. They didn't ask to come aboard. They didn't make a great noise. They just came and sat and looked at the canoe all day long, well into the night. 
They were communicating with the, with the canoe. The canoe was saying something to them. There was this one guy, and he kept looking down at me. And he put his hand out and said, I think you belong on this boat. Come. And I did. I reached up, I grabbed his hand, he pulled me on the canoe, and I've been on ever since. We saw Hokulea come around the corner and it anchored right next to my trunk, man. Couldn't believe it, man. My boat was like my girlfriend, yeah. I, I could feel that I was gonna leave her for something else. He asked me to, to come on board. Well, it was awesome. Get to sail, you know, get to, get to feel her, you know, ride the waves and, and see how well she could point and, you know, just like pulling on the sheets and, oh, wow, this is oh, unreal. It, it works, this double haul going can work, actually really works. Uh, a huge awakening happened, you know, and, and, and you could see it in the faces of the Hawaiians when we sail from place to place. While they had a vessel that reflected the design of the ancients, they could not sail in the way of the ancients. There was no one who could teach them the art of traditional celestial navigation. The traditional navigators had a sophisticated system of sailing by the stars, using the heavens, the waves, winds, and other natural clues to fix positions and determine which way to sail. We never had time to learn navigation. In fact, we didn't even quite know how to do it. An exhaustive search through Polynesia was frustrating and turned up no viable candidates. Eventually, they learned about a navigator from the tiny atoll of Satawa in Micronesia named Mau Piailuk. He was considered an exceptional navigator who came from a culture of navigators dating back hundreds of years. In his tradition, he was recognized as a master, a Pwo navigator. In Satawal, navigators were chosen at birth. The young boys were tutored by their grandfathers according to oral traditions that came from generations before. Their maps to new lands were found in the skies, and they were guided by a compass of stars found only in the heavens. They learned the stars, the currents, the winds, developing an intuitive understanding of the cosmos and a deep trust, respect, and understanding of the sea. Ramitin, <laughs> I told him about the project. I could hardly finish talking that he let go with a barrage of words. He said, you, you have to do this. Of course you have to do this. How can Polynesians live without sailing? Mo Piailug agreed to navigate the Hawaiian canoe Hokulea on her maiden voyage to Tahiti. Mo would navigate in the traditional way, using only his knowledge of the heavens and the ocean. There would be no compass, no maps, no Western navigational instruments. We're in Snug Harbor. There's a big circle of people sitting around, and Mao was in the circle. And I don't, I don't remember who it was, but I was in the circle, kind of just sitting there, had never talked to him yet. And um, someone said, hey, Mao, where's the Southern Cross? And Mao looks up and he goes, over there, behind his back. So I broke out of the circle. I ran all the way down the docks till I got past all the lights. And right there was a Southern Cross behind his back. And I said, this is a man of magic. 
I, I, didn't, I didn't even think that we were ever, ever going to meet this guy. But I came onto the canoe and from far away, I, I recognized that he was a special spirit, a special person. I know he couldn't speak English and I couldn't speak his language. So we, we just started, communication was actually no problem at all. Everything just, just, just started flowing um, as if, as if we, we, we knew each other already. He started teaching us how to lash the canoe, uh, to start to learn the stars from him, and uh, it, was, it was real different. So he would do this thing where we'd be sitting down, you know, on the pier, put you over there, he'd put me over there, he'd put another person there, and he'd situate you, and he'd teach us a dance, you know, and he'd sing. And we start to dance, and he'd tell us how to move. Well, what he was teaching us was how stars move relative to each other, and things as they rise and set, you know, and things. And, and your motion, you, you are a star. And in your motions depict the movement of the star. Mao was, was that one that was able to come back to our culture and help us to remember that these things that, that were magic to us, to watch him do all these things, and they're still magical to us, to be at the level that he's at, he's helped us to reconnect again. If I wanted to know anything about anything, about the stars, the ocean, about waves, and he would just like, he would be, he would just, doom, he would just like give me the answer right there. It was just like, and it went right, right through him to me, and then it represented who he was and everybody he learned from, all you know, the past and everything. So it's like, it's like a, a living ancestor that you could, you could finally talk to. It took an extraordinary effort to prepare Hokulea and the crew for the voyage to Tahiti. The canoe would have to withstand 40 days on the open ocean, had to be provisioned with food and water, and have whatever might be needed in the event of any emergency. The crew of novices needed to train for this long journey so that they could handle the physical rigor of a 2,500-mile voyage. A great deal was being said among the paddling clubs that those guys aren't going to get that canoe built. We got it built. And they said, those guys aren't going to sail. That canoe won't sail. And we sailed it. And then they said, well, it won't go to Tahiti. Raindrops. They hamper my vision. On May 1st, 1976, Hokulea began her epic voyage, a 2,500-mile journey from Hawaii to Tahiti. Carry us down to our destination. I want to sail to Tahiti. I don't want to fly to Tahiti. I want to see it come out of the ocean. I want to fish it out of the sea. So I knew I wanted to sail there. I never knew <laughs> it would be on Hokulea. Looking up, they all make us hiker. Hokulea, star of madness. You're the happy star. Oh, Hokulea, star of gladness. Stand beside me and be my friend. Make me smile and laugh again, yes. Hokulea, you're the star of gladness. You're the happy star. Mao had that certainty about him. He was just so above petty stuff. And Mao was everything. He wasn't just a navigator. I mean, in our canoe family, uh, Hokulea is the mother and Mao's the father. He was our doctor. He taught us 101 ways of using a coconut. It wasn't until I got on a canoe that I really understood what a coconut was for and how important it was to our people. He stayed awake for days and days and days and, and, and never even, he never even like dozed. I made sure that I was there all the time just to do whatever, whatever I could. On that voyage, we got to experience what it was like in the old days. The plants had to stay alive, the, the, the pig had to make it and be healthy enough to make the voyage. There were Hawaiian 
Russians on board who sailed for cultural reasons, and there were scientists who sailed as part of an experiment in cultural anthropology. As the voyage wore on and fatigue set in, tension grew between the crew members. I was doing something very Hawaiian, and very ancient, and I, I didn't want anything to interrupt that. And at times, that's what it became, an interruption. These, these things that, that, that were, to me, unnecessary. It was my It was 1976. We were rock up somewhere in the Wana Hukunari. Somewhere in the Wana ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、ま、
Eddie, a city and county lifeguard based on the north shore of Oahu, had saved dozens of lives in the ocean and was renowned for his courage and skill. After 72 hours at sea, the overturned vessel was spotted by a Hawaiian Airlines pilot and the crew was rescued by the Coast Guard. Eddie Aikau was never seen again. You know, he couldn't stand Hokulea being upside down and just um, being destroyed. Uh, and it's not just the physical piece of the canoe, but it was the... Eddie instinctually knew, I think, maybe better than maybe all, that the, uh, the promise of Hokulea, the potential of Hokulea, and that what he needed to go rescue was the future of, 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 the, of the power of that canoe. Uh, he knew that uh, Hokulea was not just a symbol, but it was the reality of carrying hope and healing for people that, that deserve it and need it. It could have been the, the whole end of the dream of this becoming, this being taken up by Hawaiian institutions was in jeopardy. You know? There were others that stepped forward in, in extraordinary leadership roles. And the one that was most important to me was my father. His question to me, Nainoa, you want to navigate, who's your teacher? To be honoring the traditions, to be true to the required sacred knowledge and skill base that's needed, you got to go back to the source. <laughs> Mao had retreated back to his quiet life on Satawal. But he too was haunted by failure and the sense that he had left his job in Hawaii undone. He had been unable to share his sacred knowledge beyond his shores. I know I has to go there and sit, kneel at his feet, and request, earnestly request, beg almost, be a student. Mao in his tape said he's not going to come back. Um, that was absolutely clear. I'm not going to come back to Hawaii. But we also know that if he doesn't, it's over. So that put me on an airplane. We sat on a white sand beach on a driftwood log, and his head was really low looking at the ground, and uh, he knew the story of Eddie. He was extraordinarily sad. You know, I just had a comment, and the question was, uh, you know, Mom, we don't really need you to, to navigate and find Tahiti for us. You need to help us find it for ourselves. Nanoa come see me in Saipan. He told me, you come back to Hawaii. We'd like to learn from, from you about the navigator. Mao, as we understand, at that time was one of six of the master navigators left in Micronesia, therefore on Earth. So he knew it wasn't just about us. It was the hope and the pride that Hokulea should be carrying. And I think that's why he probably came back. Only him is he, he stayed with me all the time, night time. From uh, maybe 8 o'clock to 5 o'clock. I teach him and saw him about the stars and then talk story about the navigator. The navigators were losing prominence within the Micronesian culture. And he saw very clearly that his own stature as a navigator would increase as a result of his association with Hokulea. But Mao did not see this for reasons of personal self-aggrandizement, but for the reason that he wanted to see 
the art of navigation as it was practiced in, in Sadawa to continue. Nainoa and other crew members spent two intense years learning the body of knowledge Mao had to offer. They learned the way young boys of Satawa learn, observing and feeling the subtleties of nature while on the ocean. They learned what it felt like to have their sailing vessels come alive, how to read a canoe's moods, and to intuit interaction with the winds and the sea. In 1980, Okulea set sail again for Tahiti. This time, the navigator was Hawaiian, and he carried with him the hope and pride of his people. Mao sailed not as a navigator, but a teacher. The 1980 voyage, he was really just like really kicking back and silent, and kind of stayed away from everything, he, which is which is such an honor and respect uh, for the disciplines of a navigator, you know is because it um, doesn't matter how great he is, he would never interfere or um, take over leadership or anything like that. That was, that, was like, that was a clean line that you never passed. 1980, they come with me on the Hokule, but something broke on the canoe. Then I fixed in the ocean is they come watch me. That's why maybe now it's, I'm thinking they never forget because they know. When I fix the canoe in Hawassan, they look, they watch me. The voyage was a success. Landfall in Tahiti set the stage for the expansion of traditional voyaging throughout the Polynesian Triangle. The first trip is a little bit problem, but uh, I don't know, me, I think uh, the first, first try, the sail in a ocean, uh, somebody scared and uh, make it a little bit crazy, but not too much. This trip is uh, everything good, no problem. Good sail. 
Yeah, oh yeah, good. If it wasn't for him, I, I don't think we would have uh, progressed as far as we have. Mm -hmm. You know, so all that has been done so far, and up until the time w w when we have to hand it over to somebody else, is to, thanks to him, to Mao. Yeah. You know. In 1985, Hokulea returned to Tahiti and continued on to Samoa, Tonga, Rarotonga, and Aotearoa. And in 1999, Hokulea sailed to Rapa Nui, the single most isolated landmass on the planet. It was a wonderful time, inspiring the training of new navigators and the construction of more voyaging canoes across Polynesia. For the Polynesian Voyaging Society, it was a time to realize dreams. 25 years of relearning navigation and voyaging reunited the great nation of Polynesia and inspired renewed interest in other cultural practices, language, dance, traditional arts. This expansion of voyaging throughout Polynesia brought newfound respect for Hawaiians. Once viewed as culturally lost, Hawaiians were now at the forefront of cultural revival. Literally and figuratively, the art of traditional navigation is helping native people throughout Polynesia find their way in a modern world that does not always value traditional practices. Happy because now is I know uh, the people here is they learn a little bit from me. That's why they start try again. But me, I never, I never go with them, but my body feel good because I know they they get a little bit uh, navigator, but maybe they continue sometime, but better. The cultural rejuvenation failed to reach the distant shores of Micronesia. There, Western cultural attitudes continued to threaten traditional lifestyles and values. So Piridway, the Capir Faring is water Arabu in Nau. You should remember Tabu and Lang Spassi Tabu. You have your potato Samuel Tabu. And the poor world, the Porto Raminang, you have seen a little Musipuranga or America. That's why voyaging is important, because it is hard. I mean, why wouldn't you just break out the GPS and get from point A to point B if that were the voyage, if that were the journey? And, uh, get a young child's mind to only look at the box to define its world and disconnect them from nature, from culture, from heritage.
thing about culture is that a, a people who have lost their past become the lost people. In complete acceptance of the modern culture, they should not lose the cultural past that has given them the guidance that has made them successful. And without that past, we are simply rudderless. Clay Bertelman had started this movement to build a canoe for Mao. My brother Clay, he really wanted it for Mao, really badly. It was like a small thing that, that, that we could muster up for the greatness um, that he shared. Um, it was something. Clay committing to it and all of us understanding that with Clay, that no matter what, he was going to do it, whether the materials were there or not, or whether the money was there or not, but that somehow he'd find a way to do it. It took us uh, over five years of working. Uh, it, was, it was hard just because, um, for one thing, it came at a time when, when we lost Clay. When he passed, I think for a lot of us, we understood that with his passing, his commitment was still for us to carry it through. It's a tremendous gift to a man that, that's worthy of that kind of gift, because that canoe is going to go beyond Mao's life. It'll teach a whole new generation of, of uh, Micronesian seafarers that we expect nothing back because we've been given so much already. I don't know what else we could have done. And things that would demonstrate the, uh, the appreciation we have for what he's given us. With Clay's passing, Mao assumed responsibility of overseeing the construction of his canoe, the Alangano Maisu. But there was another reason for Mo to stay in Hawaii. He had been stricken with diabetes, and his failing health required a level of medical attention not available to him in Micronesia. If Mao remained in Hawaii, dialysis would enable him to prolong his life but he would never be able to return to Satawal or witness the arrival of Maisu on the sands of his birth. For every navigator, no landfall is more precious than arriving safely home. And so it is for Mo. He returned to Satawal to receive the Maisu, leaving his son Cesario to sail in his place. Alingano Maisu accompanied by Hokulea and the escort boat Kamahele, left Hawaii to travel west for 45 days to her new home, Sarawal. It was the first voyage into the northwestern Pacific for all vessels. It was also the highest honor Mao's students could pay him. Raindrops could hamper my vision. Good luck Falling down in the teeny my mind while we sail away our time. To see her on the water was really, really special for me. 
more than the fact that she's fast, she's strong. And um, you know, she's got all these different personalities. She's got this deep sense of strength. I think that kind of surprised everybody. She's got this, this drive to always want to move. And that's my dad. The first voyage we sailed with multiple canoes where the canoes had to stay together. Beyond the physical requirements of staying together, the symbolism behind that, what I think is so key, that, that the voyage transcends the organizations. It transcends separate communities. It even transcends nations. Because now you're talking about Micronesia and Hawaii coming together. Mao told us in the beginning to stay together. Yeah. That for us as people, we need to stay together. For the success of what we need to do, stay together. He consistently said that throughout the whole process of the building of Maisu, no matter what, you folks stick together. And so for me, I hope that we're all listening to that. In this we pray, Lord, to show us the way of hope. Star of gladness. Sailing together in the largest ocean on the planet was no simple task, and challenges would be part of the long voyage until the very end. Approaching Sotomoral, the crews encountered a fierce storm, yet another test of the knowledge passed on to them from Mom. Maybe we should protect this guy by tying him down as much as we can and protect this, because it could be ready for a while. No, we're just going to keep going. We probably got 200 miles to go. I think we hope to and get centered for the island in the morning. Everybody, we can talk to each other, communicate, do whatever logistical planning, and I think everybody just really start to get spiritually ready for tomorrow. That day when we saw Sarawa coming out of the ocean, it wasn't a vociferous moment, it was a quiet moment. It's like, there's your heaven, you know, uh, you come home. Us going to Sarawa was, it was an awesome thing. It was awesome to go there and see the island, meet the people, see old friends, and really take you back in time. It made us appreciate even more, you know, what we are trying to recover. Hokulea finally embraced the sands of Satawal, the source of the navigational knowledge that guided her more than 100,000 miles throughout the Pacific. The day that we arrived there, in my mind, that might have been the most significant island on the planet. The canoe was just the vessel to be able to get us there so that we could all experience for a short amount of time what it feels like to go back in time. 
As the Hawaiians arrive with their gift, Satawal is bustling in preparation for the anticipated visitors. Well, they harvest from the sea and they harvest from the land. They're not surviving, they're thriving. chiefs on Satoal and people of Satoal are that we are thankful for this gift. The property now that is for all of us people of Satoal. We cannot return like gift but I like to request that the least we can do is give the poor to those that are recognized among our friends from Hawaii. The highest honor given to a navigator in Satawal is to become Pwo, Master Navigator. The ritual was implemented for the first time in over 50 years as part of the exchange. Mao decided to honor 16 navigators with Pwo. Included were five Hawaiians, Nainoa Thompson, Shorty Bertelman, Bruce Blankenfeld, Chad Baibayan, and Chad Paishon. Mao's son Cesario was also recognized as a master navigator. Now in the twilight of his life, Mo presided over the ceremony that would formally confer his knowledge to a younger generation and invigorate the ancient tradition. <laughs> I would like to offer, on behalf of all of us that are here today, that um, for the deepest humility and the deepest appreciation, we are very, very honored to be here today with all of you within this ceremonial court. What the Po is about is, is the navigators accepting uh, the kuleana of being the steward of that art. That you're a teacher, you're a caretaker, um, you have to recruit new people in so the art can, can, can keep on living. So we're faced with the same challenges that Mao is faced with here on the island. You, know, you could just feel the, you know, the energy and the, the importance and you know, the real seriousness of what, you know, he was trying to pass on. For Mao, it's like he's passing a torch on, which is like, we're, he's always holding a torch for us, yeah? But, but now, now he's giving it away. So that was, that was big for me. It wasn't us giving something to him. Basically, he was doing it again. He was giving us something again. So it was, it was just, oh, you know, he's still the teacher. He's still, he's still, you know, being the master. Kuvuwe, unamuwe, kukaiki, kuyau, Hawaii, hoi, ke mai, ke aloha, nui, punitai. 
o Hawaii o Kiawe Maui a Kama Moloka Inu a Hina o Ahu o Kaku i Hewa Kawa i o Manoa Kalangi Pohoni i Hau Kapale no na moku ka ula ku hai mo o i kei kana ni o kaina he pale no o ka ula no Hawaii i ni ho a tuhi tuhi pohoni Eleno a pa maulu a Hawaii two canoes are connected by shared genealogies, but will now seek out their own destinies. Maisu, under the leadership of Cesario, will sail between the atolls of Micronesia as a floating classroom to engage future generations in the teachings of the past. Okulea will embark on further adventures, carrying the newly bestowed responsibility of Huo. Although physically separated, these two canoes, and all those throughout the Pacific, remain spiritually bonded by the teachings of Papa Mao. All I remember when I left him, you know, I didn't know what to say and uh, he didn't know what to say and he was just trying to kind of push me out the door. Because everybody was gone, they were waiting for me, and but I just didn't, I, I just didn't know how to leave. And when I look back, all I could see was this silhouette of a single man in that very dark house. I knew it had to be really, really sad. So I just stopped and said, "I ain't going." And I turned around and ran back to the house. Then I sat down with him again, not knowing how you say goodbye again. I said, when we learn navigation from you, are we learning you? And he looked at me and said, yes. Then I said, so as long as we teach, then you'll always be with us. And he said, yes. Then I said, okay, I'll see you soon. Star of gladness With our body Guide Hokulea, Lord, we ask you please. In this we pray, Lord, please show us the way. Ah, oh, 